right, welcome back. So good to see you guys here, <coughs> guys, gals. You know, I'm sure you do know that we live the best of uh, the Copium series <laughs> for the last two sessions, right? right? That's the story, the true story. It truly is a pleasure to have our students present, to show you what they've done. And we select some simply because just a few uh, uh, students, a few groups of students, just simply because of the limited time we have. Uh, but I know that a lot of you put a lot of work into research, into capstone, into projects that are all presentable, and we truly appreciate it. So, speaking of good presentations, uh, Jacob Probst has worked with Dr. Rivoire and is going to present his work. All right, thank you. Um, so, this is for my 496, which I did this semester. Um, it's an extension of the phase detector that I talked about last colloquium. Um, the code in it was absolutely awful, so I spent this semester making it less awful. So, just a brief recap of what I did. So, the project itself was we took these power, tr or, um, power traces where we measured what the computer, the we so ran a program on the computer, measured measured how much like power it used, and so we got these series of data points on how much electricity it used, and then we would concatenate them together, and then we would try and predict what those what those phases were. Like here, are the actual splits. Here are what we detected would be the splits, and there's a lot more. So we had to figure out which ones are correct. So we just Made a, made a graph where each node points to the next node. And then we, uh, so then we like try to find the correct vision, which is say the red one there, which ends up being about this many times we have to check, this many intervals we have to check using to predict what it is. Now, the carrier system was very awful because we would take this data, write it out to a file, run another program on it, and then read it back in. It was horribly slow. So, that needed to be changed. And also, a thing is that Python can't actually thread. So there's the global interpreter lock, which is a mutex that prevents multiple native threads from executing Python bytecode at once. So Python is effectively only single-threaded. Um, so when we, when, we, when I tried threading it, um, after about three cores, it just flatlined. Because while it's doing I.O., it can thread effectively, but that's the most I could get out of it. So <clears throat> the solution to this is they say to just, just write it in C, because Python can inter interface with C, so like to just do it that, but that's kind of defeats the point of using Python. Then there's this other thing for multiprocess called a uh, library for multiprocessing, which spawns additional Python processes and does some inner process communication to synchronize <coughs> it. And that had issues because it required serializing all the functions. And not everything in Python is serializable, and what we were using just didn't work with that, which was kind of dumb. So I just rewrote it in a language that isn't awful, um, or is not as awful, uh, C++, which is still awful, but I, at, least, at least I can thread it. At least it was threads. So <clears throat> the code, that, now a lot of the code we were using around this used C++ anyway, which is why I used it. Um, a lot of the uh, like what the program we were shelling out to was C++, so instead, I, instead of just calling the program, I just linked those functions into my code. And the ending result is using my four thread process, using my four threads on my home home system, I got about a six times speed up. So it's better than just if I just multiport it. And that's it. Thank you. My name is Hanani, and I worked with Dr. Rivoire on uh, my project. And my project was testing some of what Jacob was working on with the other people. So the code base we were testing has been updated and worked on by people from uh, different years. So I don't know how long it has been, but it has been a while. And it has changed hands and been updated new code has been added to it. 
So the main thing I did was unit testing to make sure that everything that we're hoping the code does is actually what it's doing. And so um, for those who don't know what unit testing is, basically it's testing individual functions in a program <coughs> instead of testing the whole program as, like instead of testing one file or everything all together, you just test one function each. And so the objectives are to make sure that each function is returning what you want it to return, it's accepting what needs to be accepted, it's doing exactly what you need it to do. And then another objective is to help make the code reusable so that if someone wants to do basically the same thing in the future, they can use code that you've written instead of having to rewrite new code. And um, another objective is to find and report bugs. So um, during the course of my testing, I found a few things here and there that were problematic. And um, the last thing is to suggest <coughs> modifications to improve testability. So some of the code, like Jacob was talking about, was written badly, and so Part of what I did was to suggest ways that the code could be modified so that it could be easily tested. Um, this is just a diagram explaining the flow of how unit testing works. Basically, you get the code from, uh, we use Bitbucket, so we, we, um, I get the code from Bitbucket. Um, make changes, so I don't really make changes, but this is, this is how unit testing works when you're <coughs> doing it um, outside of the way I did it. I just skip the make changes steps and I execute the unit tests. And then I find and fix, I mean, I find the defects and fix them if applicable. And then um, review the code with Dr. Rivoire and um, make sure that everything's working as supposed to and then return it or check it back in to get help. Um, the methods I used were for, I did some Python testing and I did some C++ testing. For Python, there's a framework called unit test that I used and for C++, there's a Google <coughs> testing framework called gtest. The next thing I did was I isolated the testing environment from the um, main code body. So basically I have a copy of all the functions and all, all the files in a different um, directory instead of <coughs> having it being tested as everybody's working on it at the same time. And like I said earlier, I tested all the functions independently. So if a function was dependent on another function, I would test them separately instead of testing them together and assuming that um, one works. And then um, I use version control. So like I said, we use Bitbucket to keep track of changes. Uh, for my results, I found some bugs and um, I also found some practices that could have been changed to make the functions better. So one of the things I found was <coughs> the outputs for one or two functions were incorrect. An example is um, one of the functions I was testing takes as inputs a file with different columns and you specify what column you want it to print out. And the error was that it was only printing out the first column in the file. It was not printing out the column you specified basically and so that was a problem. Another problem I found was some functions allowed illegal input. So if zero is not supposed to be allowed, <coughs> the function would allow zero to come in and that could cause problems. Um, there was a case where the documentation was completely different from what the actual function was doing. And so it was a problem of whether the function should be doing what it's currently doing or if it was supposed to be implementing what the documentation described. Um, a big problem I had was paths because I moved all the tests to a different uh, environment and so 
they had been using relative paths to get to everything to make it work. And when I moved it, it needed to be changed to absolute paths to make it um, work. So that was something that I changed in a good chunk of the files I tested. And then one of the other things I found was that some functions were now written efficiently. So uh, I would have files that could not run until a different file had, had done what it needed to do to produce the output needed. And so that made testing a little hard because I did not have the outputs I needed from a different location. Uh, future work on this, we're hoping to be able to automate the tests instead of having to have someone going every now and then and run it, we'll just, we'll just specify how often the test should be run. Um, another thing that we're hoping to do is to create new tests um, to accommodate all the changes. So like some of the changes that are going on currently are not being tested. So future work would evolve uh, expanding the test right now to include those and um, expand the current tests I've written to include more test cases. And I was going to do a demo, but uh, I don't have an adapter for this, so I can show a picture. So this is my C++ um, testing result when I run. I can see all the functions that um, ran OK. And so green means it worked correctly. And it tells me what test it was and what file it was from. And then down here, this was a test that failed. And so you probably cannot say well, but it tells me, so I have something called actual as a variable and expected. And so it compares them and tells me this is the reason why this failed. Right here it failed because the two numbers do not match. So I was comparing two arrays that needed to be, um, that I had a fixed array with the information, with the numbers that it needed to be. And this here is telling me that the output from the function does not match what I expected it to be. And so it gives me each of the different values at the indices and tells me why, why it failed. And then here's another failed test where the function takes as inputs strings and it's supposed to concatenate them with slashes in between. But instead, it did not do that. It just um, returns the string concatenated with commas and spaces in between. So that was also a failed test. And so at the end, it tells me I have two failed tests, and um, it lists what the tests are. And um, I can go back in and figure out which test failed, why it failed, and all of that. And yeah, so. Do you have any questions? Sorry. Thank you very much. <laughs> Our next presenter is Rigo, who has also worked with Dr. Dubois. Hey, everyone. My name is Rigoberto. I worked with Dr. Rivar on making a Raspberry Pi cluster and making it into a distributed system. So before I go any further, I'd like to make a couple of definitions. A distributed system is a number of independent computers linked by a network connection. And here you can see a diagram of how a, a distributed system can be linked together. And parallel computing is a simultaneous use of multiple compute resources to solve a computational problem. So we're going to use all the computers and all our resources to work on one single problem. And a Beowulf cluster is a computing cluster comprised of identical commodity-grade computers. By commodity-grade, we mean something that you can go and buy at a store, something that is available to, uh, to the masses, not a specialized type of computer. 
An MPI is message passing interface. It's a parable library that allows processes to send um, data to another process, even if the uh, process is on another node. So that this way, we have node-to-node -node communication. And down here, you can see a diagram of how MPI works. This is how a uh, one node can send data to another node via network. And every single node has the uh, power to receive data and send data. But why does this all matter? We can save time and money by reducing the time needed to solve a computational problem. We can uh, increase our performance by reducing our execution time. We can also save money by not having to power the computers for as long. So we can solve bigger and more complex computing problems. If we can allocate all our resources to work on just one problem, of course, the more, we bunch, the more resources we bunch together, the bigger the problem we can solve. And we, we can take advantage of the hard resources that are traditionally not used when executing serial code. So most of us have uh, processors in our computers that have multiple cores, or chips, I say. But when we write code, we actually aren't taking advantage of them. We're only running our code usually just on one thread, one core. We're not taking advantage of all of the actual hardware we have. Using parallel uh, libraries and parallel techniques, we can use all of our resources to tackle a problem. And of course, the main thing that most of us care about is more performance. So here's the process of how I went about building the cluster. For the cluster, I had to install a special operating system on every single Raspberry Pi and configure it so that the network, the network would allow them to communicate. I, was, I took the Raspbian Jesse Lite operating system and stripped a bunch of stuff that we didn't need or that I didn't need, which was the mail client, the internet browser. I also stripped off some of the GUI because we obviously don't need it if we're just going to run a command line. That also helped the performance variation. Um, so we install, or I installed all the necessary uh, software, the MPR libraries, the GCC compiler, and all the dependencies. I put the cluster together. Then I test, uh, tested the cluster to ensure that each node can communicate and send information to every other node. That way we had an accurate result, or accurate measurements of actual data. Mm -hmm. Then I ran the benchmarks. Similarly, on the desktop, which was an Intel i7, I installed the operating system, installed all the necessary software, ran the test programs, and ran the benchmarks. Of course, because the desktop was not a distributed system, I didn't have to do all the uh, network interconnects. And here's a picture of the actual cluster. It looks a lot bigger on these pictures, but it's actually the size of maybe you know a small lunchbox. This is what it would look like under full load, and here's when it's idle. You can see here there's four Raspberry Pis. Down here is the network switch that they're all connected to. Here is the power supply. And something that is very interesting is that the Raspberry Pi is under full load, under full computational load, actually do require heat sinks and a fan. If not, it will actually overheat, burn out, and potentially corrupt all your data. So the main benchmark I ran was matrix multiplication. I ran it on a, with one, two, four, and eight, and 16 processes, both on a single Raspberry Pi and on the cluster. I also ran it as well on the Intel desktop. You can see here on the graph, the Intel desktop obviously is going to run a lot faster. It's a lot more expensive. It's, it's my personal gaming computer, so it was going to run a lot faster. You can see here that the cluster is the green, the Raspberry Pi is the yellow. You see how they start off similarly with just one process. But as we start adding processes, there's a discrepancy here of performance. Now, the green, the green one is running a little slower, which is the cluster, compared to just a single Raspberry Pi. And the initial hypothesis was that the Raspberry Pi wouldn't be able to compete at all against the Intel i7. But as you can see here, they're relatively close. But the cluster, there's something going on there that is actually uh, hindering our performance. And now I'd like to show you a graph of the speed up. This is how fast we can do things, or how much faster we can do things. Here, if we add uh, two processes to this one problem of matrix multiplication, we get a speed up of almost three. But for the cluster, once we get to about eight, that's our best performance. And we add, we double that to 16, we start seeing a, de uh, um, a decrease in performance. Now, for the Raspberry Pi, it's opposite. We get 8 here, and then we add 16, and we slightly get more performance. Now, at first, I thought I actually did something wrong. But after looking at to the actual or all the specs on the Raspberry Pi cluster, it turns out that it's actually the communication cost is, is what is costing us some performance. The overhead of all this communication of having to send it data back and forth to every single node is actually causing a lag. Now, it didn't happen on the Raspberry Pi because the Raspberry Pi, I spawned 16 processes, and because they were all on the same chip, they were <coughs> essentially able just to share memory with each other. They didn't have to uh, go through the network and actually communicate that way. 
So there's latency there. Um, yeah, and the limitation actually it comes from the Ethernet speeds of the Raspberry Pi. They're currently only at 100 megabits per second, the highest, at their highest speeds. Of course, most computers nowadays are at least 500 megabits per second. So that is our um, limitation. That's my limitation currently with the Raspberry Pi. Had, if there was anything I could change, I would make the Raspberry Pi's Ethernet a lot faster, and that would give us uh, better performance. And of course, I also did bring the Raspberry Pi cluster if anyone would like to see it in action or ask any questions about it. And I was inspired to do this, um, to make this cluster, because I was over at Lawrence Livermore National Lab last summer. And of course, because I was a low-level intern, they didn't want me messing with all the supercomputers and causing havoc. So I decided to make my own and so I can get some more experience. <laughs> and I'm currently still there. And I hope to continue this kind of work uh, in the future when I graduate. Questions? Could you modify the Raspberry Pi to have faster Ethernet connection? Could you like desolder it? Potentially. I don't know too much about hardware, but that possibly could be a thing that you could do. Um, I'm not 100% sure how Ethernet works in just soldering it, but that might also be, uh, <coughs> might be a change that we have to make on the motherboard itself and change other components. Of course, there are similar, uh, similar computer boards like the Raspberry Pi, such as the Asus Tinkerboard that have faster Ethernet and they have a way better chipset. Um, did you consider using Arduino rather than Raspberry Pi, and why did you choose Raspberry Pi? The simple reason I chose uh, the Raspberry Pis over an Arduino is because I just wanted to buy a Raspberry Pi. I've been wanting to have Raspberry Pis for a very long time. I've never had a purpose for them. I didn't want to just make an emulator like everyone else. So once I got this idea after talking to a couple people, and you know, that's why I went with Raspberry Pis. Right on. Would you say that the only bottleneck to the Ethernet? Currently, from the test I ran, I would say that's the only bottleneck. Of course, the, the Raspberry Pi's um, processor is a lot weaker than an Intel i7, but um, they're relatively close if you see the, the, the graph. They're not too far off from each other, just a single Raspberry Pi without the cluster. But um, I'd like to be able to test that theory, but until Raspberry Pi either increases their uh, speeds or I'm able to solder a one, like Lucas said, then I really won't be able to test it so uh, further than that. Well, um, did, did you perhaps try uh, running a program that didn't require any communication between the pies and just parallelize a program that ran some computations and output it to some file? So do you mean, um, so for the Raspberry Pi, just a single Raspberry Pi clue? single Raspberry Pi, I actually ran a uh, matrix multiplication, but it didn't have to actually communicate through the network. It was, I spawned 16 processes and they all communicated within the same, uh, the same uh, node. Okay. Other questions? Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> While they're setting up, our next presenters uh, are Jordan, uh, Lisa, and Brian. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Brian. This is Jordan. And this is Lisa. We are creating a uh, universal remote app for iOS. The idea is it would replace all the remotes you have in your home that are using IR signal. So, like your TV, your DVD player, um, some fans have remotes, things like that. Uh, this is kind of the specs we came to Kushesh with at the beginning of the semester of what we wanted to do, how we were planning on doing it. Um, we kind of broke the project up into three phases. Um, hopefully we get all three phases done, but we uh, committed to at least two no matter what. We knew that we could get through. So kind of the first step um, we had was we used Arduino to actually do the sending of the IR because iPhones do not have uh, IR blasters, which is why the app really doesn't exist right now. Um, so we have to connect to our Arduino and then have the Arduino actually send the signal to the device. Um, we found a library that Arduino has called uh, IR Lib, and it gave us the capability of sending the signal and receiving signals with just using a IR LED and a receiver. 
Um, one of the problems we did have in this step was uh, we originally had our Arduino Uno, or uh, 101, which is a 32-bit board. And the library does require a 8-bit board. So we couldn't run it on the 101, so we had to also buy a Uno, um, which causes problems later on, which we'll get into later. Um, the other thing is staying up circuitry. We're all CS majors, so that was a little bit fun. Um, we got pretty close on our own with a minor tweak that made it fully work. And then also blasting the IR signal. Um, because the, the Uno only runs on five volts, signal wasn't very powerful, so the device had to be really close to the Uno. Um, so by changing the circuitry a little bit, we were able to um, further the distance that that signal could go. Step two was to get the uh, Arduino to talk to an app on the iPhone. Um, first problem we ran into was the Uno has no way of talking to iPhone. We wanted to use Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, and we decided Bluetooth. So the 101 has Bluetooth uh, enabled in the Uno or in the Arduino. So we use the 101 to actually connect to the phone. And how that works is this application over here is actually the uh, Arduino 101. Pretty much you set up what you want with Bluetooth. You say you've got a device, you give the device a name. You can give a Bluetooth device um, services as many as you want. And each service can have characteristics, which is just a value. And you can have as many of those as you want. And the value is what you're actually reading to and writing to. Once you have all that, you advertise that information out so that your, your central device, which in our case is our app, scans for the, for the uh, Bluetooth signal you're sending out, for all that stuff you're saying out. And then um, while it scans, it's picking up what characteristics that device shares. So for example, with ours, we say we have um, three values. One is the IR code, one is the IR type, and one is the bit length of the IR code. And the app actually picks up those three values and we can read to them and write to them. Um, yeah, another big thing was none of us had worked with Bluetooth. It's, we found out to be a server um, slave kind of communication with each other. And uh, we had to set that up on both the 101 and uh, the Swift app. So one of the things that Brian kind of hand waved here, which turned out to be like a total pain. Um, so again, we have two Arduino boards. One of them, the 101, has the Bluetooth on it, which is what we were using for you know and capturing the signals and whatnot um, between the phone and the Arduino slash uh, the IR board. But so the pain is, is that the uh, 101 works with like a 32-bit processor, and the IR library wants specifically an 8-bit processor, which the Uno is running on. So we had to get the data transmitted from the 101 to the Uno. And back when I was taking game programming, I thought um, that Unreal Engine had the worst documentation. And then we <laughs> found the Arduino documentation, and it is literally Satan. Um, so. Trying to work with that, trying to figure out how to send data over using the wire library. Uh, we had to, it, it is janky. It is, <laughs> we had to do a massive workaround of data types and stuff to get the information from one Arduino to the other Arduino to then send to the uh, uh, breadboard with the IR blaster on it to send out the signal. Um, so yeah, if you want to go to the next. And then, um, sorry, this is my first time seeing the presentation we just made it this morning. Friday, <laughs> this morning. Um, it's kind of last minute here, but uh, so we want to send it from the app <laughs> to the desired application on the device. Is this going backwards? Is this a saying, or is it saying getting it? So this, we had a problem with um, the once again the data typing because the board is a eight bit and a thirty two bit a long. Uh, unsigned long, according to Arduino, is a 32-bit value. And um, on Swift, it was not. So when we were sending the signal, we were sending one thing, but it was receiving something else. 
which ended up being a big problem. So we had to make sure that all of our data types matched up, but not the name of the data type, but the bit length of the data type. And then lastly, we have to build the actual like phone app. And for that, we were using Swift and then uh, building out an internal database on the phone using Swift's core data. So see a bunch of you are in 470, so you know what core data is. But for those that aren't, um, basically your phone has like internal storage and core data is just a wrapper for SQLite database, which you can use to interact with the storage on your phone. Um, and we were using that, we are using that for storing <coughs> data for specific remotes that you can have on your phone. So like um, Brian and Jordan were talking about like IR codes and various values to interact with the Arduino and sending uh, stuff to different devices. And yeah, so if we have enough time, uh, we try to demo it. Okay, cool. Um, so it's been working. Uh, <laughs> last night we had the LED burnout on us, and it, we were like sitting there, and we we're like, we haven't changed anything. Like, what is going on? And then Brian like looks at the LED, and he's like, this thing's black. Uh, <laughs> I don't think it's supposed to be. So we swapped that out, um, and hopefully, well, and it was working last night and stuff. So. Basically, we can't, I don't think we have a way to plug in this behind you. DVD player, uh, but I meant like the visual yeah. cable. Oh. Um, so right now, the app is not very pretty looking. <laughs> That's kind of the next step that we're moving into is fixing the app. But ideally right here, um, this is your main screen when you open the app. You'd add the device here, and like I had a DVD player. So it's got these buttons, and pretty much when you click on the button, it's going to send the signal all the way through, which is what we're going to kind of demo right now. Um, because we can't plug the DVD player into the projector, um, we, we won't be able to demonstrate. Like the only the thing you're really going to be able to see is it turn on and off by a small LED on there and the tray to open and close. <laughs> Also, the last issue, well, not last, we ran into a lot of issues, but one of the issues we ran into <laughs> was <laughs> um, the emulator on the computer for Swift cannot actually use your computer's Bluetooth. So to do any testing, we actually have to use the actual phone. So that's why you will not see us click this button, you'll actually see us click a button on the phone. And also that meant working on this project was there wasn't a lot of remote work we could do. We all had to meet up with Brian and his phone to be able to test anything that we did on the app. So the efficiency was terrible, but we managed it. Okay, you up and running? Uh, yeah, should I just re-upload the script? I know it's running right now, but I don't know if that's going to connect to the serial monitor to be able uh, to well, like yours, yours isn't displaying anyways. So one well, no, I meant like just to see to make sure that we're like getting signals. Every one day. of the things Arduino does that's probably the only helpful thing is they have a serial monitor, which is pretty much a console. So for debugging, the only debugging you could do is print to this screen. Um, so what you'll see is the uh, when we press the button, um, the code that goes through the Uno right before it actually gets blasted out will actually show up on the screen here, so you guys can kind of see the values a little bit. So I just pressed the the uh, power button. Oh. The power button has the, the very top number right here. This is the actual uh, value of the uh, IR code. This right here is the type of the IR code. There's, I don't know, a dozen different types out there. Um, and then this 20 represents how many bits the actual code was. Because the IR code really is just a bunch of on and offs very fast and how long they last is what is actually being sent. So now that DVD's player's on, now I will press the uh, open and close button. Hopefully it. <laughs> so that's the uh, code for the open and close, and then because it's the same device, it has the same um, type and 
the same bit length, and it did not actually open, which is hit only it, it natural. <laughs> Last time it did it when we had the DVD player off. So. <laughs> Maybe there's no power going to the output. No, I mean, the DVD player had just turned on. I just turned it off. But OK, so. Thank you, DVD player. <laughs> yeah, now the power's not even working. We're going backwards here. <laughs> Let's try it closing out of that. Last night? Yeah. Yeah, you guys were there for that. You saw that happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, some of you that were in the lab working with us, actually, we gave you a little demo last night. <laughs> All right, so DVD player turned on now. Yeah. We'll give it a sec to load. <laughs> so the open and close is not happy with us right now. <laughs> is it a DVD in the right now? Uh, uh, not currently. Oh, you took it out? Yeah, I took it out because we had to travel with it. But this, this is actually a video, a short video of the first time we got the power to turn on and off. And it was very exciting because it took us about two weeks to do. <laughs> so you see we've got the two boards, the app, and then the two serial monitors open. That's what our original app looked like. <laughs> Just to test it. Or the UI for it. We got the signal to the first board, the signal to the second board, and the power light is on on the DVD player, which is what you guys could actually kind of see here. So going forward, we need to still um, obviously fix, fix that bug. <laughs> but um, you should, our end goal is to be able to take the remote for the DVD player, press a button, and that code gets sent all the way into the app, the app store it, and save it to the button on the app. So you can dynamically make your remote for any remote you want. And that's something that we have working as well as another script that's running on the Uno that when you <coughs> click the remote, it receives the signal and it tells you all the information that we need in order to be able to send a signal back. So what we're working on, hopefully to have done by next week, is having the 101 board send that signal back to the phone via Bluetooth. And then we, like Brian was saying, to be able to dynamically allocate um, the signals on your remote control. So when we receive a signal from the actual remote, this is what we're getting. We're getting all this. Uh, all this data. This right here was our type. It's a Sony type. Our value, which it's printing it in um, hex, but we're storing it in uh, as a long in uh, decimal. And then the 20 bits, which was the length of the code. And then this right here is actually the raw data of the uh, lights and how long it stays on and off. But pretty much, um, ideally, when you press the button here, this data would all get sent to the phone. We'd store it and then be able to reproduce it using the app. Uh, any questions? Cool. Thank you so much. For This is just a sample of the great work that our students do. Uh, we are not graduating this semester and are interested in working on different projects. You can see the variation here, or to some faculty about their projects and whether they have questions for you that match your interest. Thank you so much for coming. Please come back. A week from today, uh, we will have more presentations and awards and a discussion about courses for next semester. Thank you very much. Thank you.